bonjour tout le monde. Si vous pouvez euh, pre prendre une place, on va commencer. You're here for uh, centering indigenous, black, and people of color uh, in, as well as immigrant and refugee experiences. Uh, la séance va être autant en anglais et en français. Um, if you need um, simultaneous interpretation, you could go grab um, some of the devices outside to the right. Um, today we have with us five speakers for four presentations. Um, they'll each have uh, 15 minutes, and then at the end we'll have some time for questions. Donc, si vous pouvez prendre note de vos questions pour que, à la fin, quand on arrive à la période de questions, vous pourrez euh, toutes les poser. Um, on vous rappelle aussi que il euh, y a des euh, principes communautaires que vous pouvez trouver sur le euh, la programme. Uh, my name is Roberto Ortiz Núñez. I'm very happy to moderate this session as well. I'll moderate the panel and the questions. Uh, on va aller jusqu'à midi 45. Donc, um, voilà, puis comme vous le savez, si jamais uh, vous avez besoin de soutien, il y a uh, l'organisme Health Initiative for Men pour du soutien en anglais et en espagnol. Um, ou l'organisme Réseau pour du soutien en français. Uh, puis finalement, um, we remind you that this session is being recorded and posted on the Summit 2022 content library after the event. Um, so let's start with the first presentation, Reflections on the Sexual Orientation and Gender Identity, Project Intersectional Understanding of Healthcare, Culture and Belonging for LGBTQ plus South Asian, Middle Eastern and Indo-Caribbean. Our presenter, Vibhuti Kacholia, is a current second year Master of Public Health student at Dalalana School of Public Health at the University of Toronto. She worked at the Alliance for South Asian AIDS Alliance from summer 2021 until this fall as a capacity building coordinator. She currently works at the Factor in Wentash Faculty of Social Work as a research assistant and assistant policy analyst at the Public Health Agency of Canada. Hello everyone, thank you so much. I'm so excited to share about our project today. So before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge that ASAP is located in Toronto, derived from the Mohawk word Takaranto, meaning where there are trees standing in the water. Toronto is the subject of the District One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant between the Haudenosaunee and Iroquois Confederacy and allied nations to care and share for the land around the Great Lakes. The traditional land of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, uh, Huron-Wendat, Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit River, Toronto is now home to diverse First Nation, Métis, and Inuit people. And acknowledging the continued presence and powerful resistance of Indigenous people all across Turtle Island, on this land we are committed to uplifting and actively contributing to Indigenous sovereignty and self-determination. So first I'd like to introduce the Alliance for South Asian AIDS Prevention, or ASAP. It's a nonprofit organization committed to serving South Asian, Middle Eastern, and Indo-Caribbean, or SEMAIC, LGBTQ plus community members who are living with, at risk of, or affected by HIV or related health conditions. Started in 18, 1989, ASAP provides culturally responsive, holistic health promotion and support services from various channels, including education, settlement, support and capacity building. So the project I'm here to talk to you today about is the Sexual Orientation and Gender uh, Identity Project, or the SOGI Project. Beginning in October of 2020, the project was funded by WAGE and was in collaboration with the Enchanté Network in Montreal and SHARE Vancouver. The overarching goal of the SOGI Project was to create a training module aimed at healthcare and social service providers throughout the country who serve SEMAIC LGBTQ communities. We aim to execute this project within a community-informed and participatory methodology, taking an iterative process and approach to developing and sharing this resource. 
This project was created to address large gaps in the literature and guidelines when it comes to this population. So make LGBTQ plus individuals in Canada are virtually invisible uh, from the academic literature, especially Middle Eastern and Indo-Caribbean LGBTQ plus populations, and there are no established trainings regarding histories and be best practices for the community. So in this presentation, I'm first gonna go through the development of the project and then share my reflections as well. So in line with our methodology, our first step was to understand what providers in our community wanted to highlight and teach in this training. We assembled two surveys aimed at service providers and service users who identified as part of the SEMAIC LGBTQ plus community. The service provider survey asked about existing knowledge known about the community as well as information and gaps about service uh, provider services like language translation services. For SEMAIC LGBTQ plus service users, we focused on understanding their experiences within healthcare and social service um, provisions and what barriers to access they had. So this needs assessment provided us wonderful insight, and it was clear that both parties were frustrated by the lack of training in serving this population. So we advertised the service user surveys in five different languages, you can see them here, and the service provider surveys in English and French. After running the survey for around three months, we got 75 diverse voices for each survey that informed our training development and goals. Throughout the project, we had meetings each month with our project advisory committee, which was a group of eight fantastic community members from Vancouver, Toronto, Ottawa, and Montreal in sectors including uh, healthcare, academia, and LGBTQ plus community work. They also came from uh, various cultural backgrounds and collectively spoke Tamil, Hindi, Farsi, Arabic, and, oh, yes, and more. Each month, we would meet over Zoom to discuss the project at each step and even ran through preliminary trainings with them. They were paid $50 honoraria for each meeting for their time and expertise. So the training itself became a six-part module that covered a large range of topics, including some make specific information about rights and histories, to foundational knowledges around sexuality and gender, and finally actionable and discussion-based modules going through anti-oppression principles um, and take-home lessons. So while we covered traditional SOGI material like definitions of what sexuality and gender mean and pronouns, we also explored topics like kink, alternative family structures, and examples of LGBTQ, Semaic folklore and media. So we developed these modules through extensive literature searches, input from the pack, and our team's own lived experiences, not only on our capacity building team, but all the greater ASAP staff. So we included short video interviews from the ASAP staff members throughout the training to provide some real life examples and facilitate some case study discussions as well. In December of 2021, we also gained a new member on our team based in Montreal who facilitated French versions of this training. So we had the exciting opportunity to condense our larger module down to three training module uh, in French aimed at Francophone providers. You can try to oh, okay. Sorry, I'm gonna talk a little bit slower. <laughs> Um, our training was delivered through Zoom, as well as an online interactive module. We had three rounds of English training and two rounds of French training on Zoom within the first six months of 2022, with about 60 participants throughout all the trainings. We can see, you can see our flyer here on the right. So we had a lot of interest for these trainings, but also had to deal with a lot of trolls attacking our Facebook pages um, and advertisements as well. So it was a very tumultuous process to advertise, but we were really excited about the reach that we got. Um, so at the end of each round, we had a discussion circle for participants to talk to each other about the trainings and go deeper into certain topics that interested them. The QR code on the screen here will take you to the online interactive module housed on our website. Our training slides alongside voice recordings of our facilitation make it a great permanent resource uh, to be shared with others in the future. So now to the reflection. Our team was very surprised with who came to our trainings. Originally, our trainings were made for the target audience of a cis, white, heterosexual service provider. However, the vast majority of our participants were service providers who were either SEMEG or LGBTQ, or had connection to the LGBTQ plus community. It was really insightful for our team as 
we provided these trainings with individuals who shared one of the intersecting identities we were talking about, and it was no surprise that the overarching theme of our entire presentations and trainings was intersectionality. What it means to hold both a queer and racialized identity and why it matters to consider this unique intersection when providing services to this community. Across the board, all participants enjoyed learning about the LGBTQ plus rights in Semaic countries and Semaic culture overall, especially in the French trainings. Participants also enjoyed learning about Indo-Caribbean populations specifically whose experiences and cultural context are often not disaggregated or spoken about in the mainstream. So there were a few key themes in our discussions throughout the 20 trainings. We challenged participants to decenter their narratives around what it meant to take care and to be well. One example that really sticks out to me was uh, once we proposed to the group a scenario in which a Semaic pa parent comes into a primary care physician's office and asks about so-called conversion therapy for their child. One white participant in our training quickly raised their hand and told us they would smugly tell the parent that it is now illegal in Canada and just leave it at that. We then asked the participant to consider, where did the parent hear about this practice? What are the dominant narratives around this practice in their community? And why would the parent even think about this option for their child? Would it be out of fear or ignorance or worry? With all these possibilities in mind, we asked participants to come to these conversations with curiosity and empathy. We stress the importance and the responsibility of being the first point of contact for these individuals to have these difficult conversations and meeting participants and individuals where they are so to ensure no harm on the LGBTQ plus people in their lives. Another participant in response to the suggestion also said that the worst case response to the suggestion would be the parent ultimately like shutting down and finding someone else who maybe had differing values that affirmed what they were thinking and ultimately cause harm. So it's really important to come with an open mind and even though we know in our community that things are wrong and they are historically have been so harmful to our community, people are on different paths of their journey to acceptance and to education. So we also took the time to explain historical and ongoing contests for Semaic LGBTQ plus people in their home countries, as these understandings could be key in building a foundation for interpersonal relationships between service providers and users. For example, an individual coming from a country where homosexuality is criminalized may have a difficult time disclosing behaviors, asking for clarification about their health, and care or just postponing care altogether. Another conversation that came up in every round of training was a fear of getting things wrong, like pronouns and chosen names. Many of our Semaic participants felt a pressure to be perfect and in turn shied away from these conversations instead. We spoke through these anxieties with participants and stressed the, in pursuit, or stressed the pursuit of doing better each time instead of perfection. We talked about how to give a good apology using one of my favorite resources, Mia Mingus's How to Give a Good Apology. I would highly recommend looking that up. The importance of being open to feedback and criticism and not centering themselves in these conversations, not to take things personally and decentering their comfort. One of the most exciting parts of the training were the spectrum of service providers who were present. We had translators, professors, community organizers, government employees, caseworkers, and more, all across Canada. This led us to have truly robust conversations about how topics uh, of these trainings could be applied across various health and social service sectors and from province to province. Overall, the SOGI project was an immense learning experience, and our team felt so privileged to share experiences, our cultures, and our struggles with our participants. It also felt like we were making space for queer Semaic people in 2S LGBTQI plus discourses in Canada. It's no, it's no um, surprise that Semaic communities, so South Asian, Middle Eastern, and Indo-Caribbean communities are the largest visible minority in Canada, making one fourth of the visible minorities in the country. So the SOGI project gave us an opportunity to declare that we're here and we're, and we're queer. So that's it, you know? And so, while the SOGI project has formally come to an end, ASAP is, with the support of WAGE, is now taking on early steps in implementing the Identity, Diversity, Equity, and Accessibility, or IDEA project. Taking a similar approach to what we did with SOGI, the team is now looking internally 
to provide our staff, board members, uh, volunteers, and agency partners in a training module that covers topics relevant to their work, including anti-black racism, indigenous history and reconciliation, casteism and colorism, disability, and immigration. Beginning with a needs assessment and focus group, we look forward to building a toolkit, trainings, and resources to ensure individuals at ASAP and our partners are critically thinking about their biases and how it may affect their work in this field. So that's all from me. Thank you so much. And feel free to get in contact with our staff at ASAP or myself. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bibuti. Um, we're going to move to the next one. La présentation, l'apport du soutien par les pairs au bien-être des personnes LGBTQI+, migrantes, résultat d'une évaluation communautaire au sein d'Agir Montréal. Uh, our presenter, Javier Fuentes Bernal, is a PhD student in social work at the University of Montreal under the guidance of Edward Lee. Holder of a master's degree in social work, their experiences include social work practice with LGBTQI plus migrant people and community-based research. Javier currently sits on the board of directors of AGIR, Action LGBTQI plus avec les immigrantes réfugiés. Javier. Bonjour tout le monde. Merci beaucoup pour la présentation. J'espère que vous allez bien. Ça fait longtemps que je ne parle pas avec un micro, alors j'espère que les débits, ça va être bon et les volumes, ça va être assez fort. Alors, aujourd'hui, je vais vous présenter les résultats de mon mémoire de maîtrise qui s'inscrit dans une recherche communautaire plus large qui a été menée en partenariat avec Agir Montréal, qui a mobilisé des approches de recherche communautaire et qui a porté sur l'apport du soutien par les pairs au bien-être des personnes LGBTQ plus migrantes. Agir Montréal, c'est un organisme que j'ai présenté à la prochaine diapositive qui est basé à Montréal. Alors, les personnes qui ont été plus migrantes portent plusieurs identités eh, marginalisées. Et par ce fait, eh, nos communautés sont souvent exposées à plusieurs types de violences, plus, plusieurs types d'oppression, que ce soit dans les pays d'origine, que ce soit dans les pays de transit ou dans les pays d'accueil. Au Canada, bien que la reconnaissance... Oh, sorry. Je suis en train d'avancer le diapo. OK. Alors, au Canada, bien qu'il y ait une progression, une évolution positive de la reconnaissance juridique des personnes LGBTQ plus migrantes, notamment dans les politiques migratoires informées par l'intersectionnalité et par les genres, et bien, nos communautés continuent à être confrontées à plusieurs types de barrières systémiques, à plusieurs types d'oppression, que ce soit en lien avec l'homo, lesbophobie, transphobie, avec le racisme, avec la, la xénophobie, le sexisme, etc. Et voici un diagramme en fait, qui explique bien comment ce processus d'oppression sociétale peut s'intérioriser et en fait accroître les stigmas des personnes LGBTQ plus migrantes. Alors, on peut voir comment des facteurs socioculturels comme euh, le racisme, comme la discrimination, le, la, la pauvreté, euh, l'homo, lesbophobie, transphobie, ben, ça va avoir un impact sur le plan psychosocial, avec euh, par exemple de l'isolement social, avec euh, une difficulté aussi à, à, à s'identifier euh, comme personnes qui appartiennent à, aux, aux populations LGBTQ, par exemple. Et tout ça, c'est aussi inscrit dans, dans quelque chose qui est un modèle, en fait, qui s'appelle euh, le stress minoritaire et qui a été développé par Ian Meyer dans les années 90 et qui montre, en fait, comment pour les populations, euh, les minorités sexuelles et des genres, cette oppression sociale va finalement euh, s'intérioriser et va créer un stigma envers soi-même, un stigma envers l'identité qu'ils portent et aussi une difficulté à pouvoir s'associer avec des autres personnes ou organismes ou initiatives LGBTQ+. Alors, il va y avoir un rejet, un sentiment de, de culpabilité, de honte, et que finalement, ça va avoir un impact sur les aspects psychologiques avec des taux plus élevés d'anxiété, de dépression, de situations suicidaires qui sont beaucoup plus importants chez les personnes demandeuses d'asile et réfugiés LGBTQ+. 
Alors, pour euh, vous présenter le soutien par le père, en fait, le soutien par le père, c'est euh, un type de soutien qui est basé sur le savoir expérientiel et qui euh, va euh, être plus, euh, en fait, informé par euh, la trajectoire individuelle et personnelle des personnes plutôt que par des formations académiques ou professionnelles. Alors, euh, ces personnes... Euh, euh, bien qu'ils n'ont pas reçu une formation académique euh, ou euh, professionnelle, ils peuvent euh, fournir du soutien auprès des, des, des autres personnes qui traversent des situations similaires et difficiles. Ce type de soutien est aussi euh, euh, un outil pour diminuer les inégalités sociales de santé et faciliter l'accès aux services. Et euh, dans les dernières décennies, de plus en plus de recherches démontrent que c'est un type de soutien qui offre, euh, en fait, qui va venir favoriser le bien-être et la santé mentale des personnes LGBTQ plus migrantes dans les contextes nord-américains et canadiens. Et euh, alors, dans le soutien par la peur, on peut euh, pas seulement, comme, il faut, il faut le voir comme un soutien qui va être pratique, si on veut, dans la, en termes de navigation sociale, en termes d'accès aux soins de santé, comment et pouvoir et, et, transiter un parcours, un processus qui est extrêmement compliqué, comme c'est le processus d'immigration, par exemple, et aussi le processus d'affirmation de santé minoritaire en termes de sexe et de genre. Et, mais il y a aussi tout un volet affectif, émotionnel, où et, il y a un accompagnement où les personnes vont pouvoir se reconnaître chez l'autre. Alors, euh, cette reconnaissance de l'autre, cet effet miroir, ça va venir en fait apporter beaucoup pour, le, pour réduire le stigma qu'on qu vient de parler dans la dernière diapositive. Alors, pour les objectifs de la recherche, rapidement, c'était euh, d'évaluer le système par le père euh, au sein d'Agir et de formuler des pistes d'action. Euh, la recherche a été menée par le euh, professeur Edward Lee, qui se trouve dans la salle. Merci, Ed et euh, c'était mené à l'Université de Montréal, à l'École de travail social. Et alors, je vais parler... Euh... Désolé, je suis en train de mêler mes affaires. <rire> et, et alors, ça, ce sont les objectifs. Et en fait, je vais parler d'Agir. Agir, c'est un organisme par et pour les personnes LGBTQ+, migrantes, euh, et qui travaille principalement avec des membres bénévoles et qui euh, fournit ce service notamment pour les personnes LGBTQ+, réfugiées et demandeurs d'asile à Montréal. Alors, mon rôle au sein du projet de recherche plus large, c'était euh, de faire euh, la coordination du projet. Et finalement, avec la permission d'agir, j'ai décidé que ce soit mon projet de maîtrise en travail social. Et par la suite, euh, après avoir culminé le processus, j'ai décidé aussi de m'impliquer au sein d'agir comme membre du conseil d'administration. Alors, pour parler un peu de notre méthodologie, nous avons mobilisé des approches d'évaluation émancipatrice qui tient en compte du processus d'évaluation comme un outil d'empowerment. Alors, on ne va pas seulement se fier aux résultats de ce processus, mais aussi à comment on mène le processus et qui s'inspire eh, d'Agne Eri, ce sont des auteurs qui, qui en parlent, mais ce processus s'inspire eh, aussi de, eh, des approches eh, de Paolo Freire. Eh, en termes d'éducation populaire, des approches anti-oppressives, et qui en fait va venir comme mettre le focus sur l'importance que les personnes directement concernées soient impliquées dans l'ensemble du processus, et même dès la conception jusqu'à aussi la production du savoir, et avoir cette reconnaissance dans, dans, cette, dans cet espace. Alors, nous avons euh, mobilisé aussi un comité consultatif avec Agir, composé par euh, trois membres du conseil d'administration, qui en fait euh, vont, ont, sont venus vraiment orienter la démarche en termes d'avoir plus de connaissances des réalités du terrain. Et, puis nous, euh, nous avions aussi un rôle avec, euh, à, à, du fait d'avoir un peu plus de distance du terrain, de venir fournir et les retombées que ce soutien-là a pu avoir auprès des usagers, et des retombées positives comme des limites. Et, et, puis c'était un processus qui a été aussi et, très important à et, tenir en compte en fait, les capacités des membres d'agir. Parce que quand on parle de faire de la recherche communautaire, ben, il y a beaucoup de eh, processus aussi où les organismes sont en état de survie, par exemple, surtout les petits organismes par et pour. 
Alors, de tenir en compte de ses capacités d'avoir beaucoup de flexibilité par rapport aux rencontres, c'était euh, crucial. Et euh, finalement, c'était en fait à agir, de décider qu'est-ce qu'ils allaient faire avec les résultats de notre recherche. Et finalement, d'un côté plus personnel, ben, j'ai décidé de, de m'impliquer au sein d'Agir pour euh, continuer mon, mon alliance et, et ma contribution avec eux. Alors, euh, quelques données collectées. On a fait 14 entretiens qualitatifs en français, en anglais, en espagnol auprès des usagers, des pères aidants, des employés, qui à l'époque, il y avait deux employés et des, membres, des anciens membres du conseil d'administration. Je vais passer rapidement pour aller au cœur de cette présentation, qui c'est les retombées. Alors, et sur le plan de la santé mentale, nous avons constaté parmi la plupart des participants une amélioration du sentiment d'appartenance, d'empowerment et de réduction de l'isolement. Il y avait aussi, eh, sur le plan de la navigation sociale, une amélioration des compétences, notamment pour les pères aidants, en termes d'avoir, par exemple, une expérience canadienne qui pouvait les aider à mieux naviguer les processus, les marchés d'emploi. Et eh, aussi, eh, une meilleure navigation pour les usagers du processus d'immigration et de l'accès aux services sociaux et de santé. Et par rapport aux liens sociaux, et plusieurs participants ont mentionné le fait d'avoir créé des amitiés profondes et même d'une famille choisie, et le fait de défendre ses droits et de eh, s'inscrire dans un processus plus large, ça les aidait à... Eh, ils l'ont identifié en fait comme un levier de bien-être individuel, mais aussi eh, collectif. Quelques défis. Alors, eh, il y avait l'ambiguïté du rôle de, de la paire du fait que euh, le fait de ne pas avoir des limites claires, par exemple, en termes de, de mandat, de tâches, et ça pouvait euh, amener à des dilemmes éthiques, par exemple, avec des personnes qu'elles pouvaient connaître, et parfois aussi une surcharge de travail, et ça pouvait finalement euh, mener à des expériences de burn-out qu'on a constaté parmi quelques participantes. Alors, c'était aussi associé au manque de supervision et de formation en fait, on fait les quantités de formation et de supervision eh, qu'il faut les voir aussi avec une lunette plus large eh, parce que c'est une réalité de plusieurs organismes communautaires d'être dans cet état de précarité. Alors, quelques, défis, quelques eh, pistes de réflexion. Eh, nous avons constaté l'importance de clarifier les rôles des pères aidants, de, les mandats, les responsabilités et de maintenir l'approche par et pour, pas pour en fait, pouvoir impliquer les personnes directement concernées dans les soutiens, et notamment pour les personnes migrantes et de précaires, pouvoir avoir plus de flexibilité pour favoriser cette implication, renforcer la bienveillance organisationnelle pour pouvoir aussi faire des check-in plus constamment, des meilleures formations et des meilleures supervisions et euh, aussi créer euh, un une comité évaluatif au sein d'Agir que nous sommes en train de réaliser en ce moment pour que ce soit l'organisme qui réalise les évaluations de leurs propres services. Concernant le volet recherche, ben, euh, de, con de constamment réfléchir par rapport à nos positionnalités et privilèges en tant que chercheurs, étudiants chercheurs qui travaillons avec euh, la communauté à laquelle nous appartenons ou pas, c'est vraiment important, surtout quand on ne travaille pas avec les communautés avec lesquelles on appartient, d'avoir vraiment cette humilité et vraiment cette constante auto-réflexion par rapport à que en fait, nos actions ne soient pas en train de reproduire des éléments d'oppression et des éléments extractivistes. Et faciliter en fait aussi un environnement de recherche qui va impliquer les personnes directement concernées dans les positions de leadership et de prise de décision et faire attention aux capacités de l'organisme partenaire parce que ça peut mener à une surcharge de travail pour eux, le fait de faire ce type de démarche et faire beaucoup d'attention à ne pas produire, reproduire les oppressions sociétales quand on travaille avec ce type de démarche méthodologique. Et finalement, ça c'est une un euh, extrait d'un team qui est trouvé particulièrement riche. Je pense qu'on ne le voit pas au complet. Alors, je vais, je vais le lire. Euh, 
les soutiens par les pères, je les soutiens toujours. Ça fait partie du self-care. Donc, c'est aussi un acte de résistance parce que ces activités, pour moi, sont un acte de résistance. Tout comme s'entourer et regarder, comme regarder un film. Et après, il y a une discussion. C'est très important pour montrer que nous existons. Chez nous, par exemple, nous faisons ça aussi, mais il fallait se cacher. Mais ici, nous pouvons le faire ouvertement. Donc, c'est aussi un acte de résistance. Créer un espace sécuritaire, c'est la meilleure chose qui brise l'isolement. Pour moi, ce soutien émotionnel, c'est « j'ai de l'espoir ». J'ai de l'espoir en tant que membre, mais aussi la façon dont les gens t'identifient comme « un insider ». Tu sais que tu as un espace sécuritaire. On se sent comme sécurisé. Alors, comme quelqu'un « insider », tu sens comme si tu as de l'espace, tu as une communauté. Merci beaucoup. Muchas gracias, Javier. Um, on passe à notre prochaine présentation avec Steve Bastien de Réseau, Dura Queer and Black, How Sexual Racism is Affecting Our Communities. Steve est responsable du programme Communaut au sein de l'organisme communautaire Réseau. La santé et le mieux-être des hommes gays ou bisexuels cis et trans sont au cœur de la mission de cet organisme montréalais actif depuis 1991. Cominot offre des services de soutien aux hommes noirs issus de la diversité sexuelle et des genres pour favoriser leur santé sexuelle, physique, mentale et sociale. Steve œuvre dans les domaines de l'intervention sociale et communautaire depuis plus de 20 ans. Steve. Bonjour, bonjour, bonjour. I've been told that a lot of you find French sexy. Right? So it's going to be in French, ça va être en français. But I might pull a Justin Trudeau out of me and go back and forth between French and English. Hashtag Justin. Um, so I'm Steve. I use il, him, he pronouns. I'm from Montreal, um, Joe Jaguet. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about me. Je suis né à Montréal il y a plusieurs décennies. 50. Proud of it. And mes parents sont des immigrants d'origine haïtienne qui sont arrivés pour avoir une meilleure vie au Québec. Et je suis le premier de deux enfants. J'ai grandi dans une famille où on nous a appris la solidarité, le respect de soi et le travail individuel, communautaire et de faire partie d'un changement et d'une évolution. Nos parents nous ont appris à ma sœur et à moi qu'on pouvait tout faire, qu'on pouvait devenir ce qu'on voulait devenir dans la société, en autant qu'on travaille avec les gens et qu'on construise une société au quotidien. Je vous dis ça parce que ça a eu une incidence sur l'homme que je suis devenu, sur le travailleur social, sur le citoyen que je suis aujourd'hui en 2022. Quand euh, j'ai vu l'offre d'emploi à Réseau, après une vingtaine d'années dans le milieu de l'éducation, it was clear that that job was for me. I needed a change. It was the pandemic. And I said, OK, I'm the one who's going to be part of this program. The program itself is a new program after a research that has been done in Montreal among black Afro-descended men, gay, bi, cis, trans. I'm going to tell you all about this, but enjoy. Isn't it beautiful? And uh, we decided, Réseau, even before I was aboard, uh, decided to uh, know the needs of the black community. Because it's been proven that black men, gay, bi, MSM, didn't see themselves in the social services and health services. Therefore, there was no role models, no professionals that looked like us, and it had impact on our mental, physical health. And Réseau uh, is an organization working into health, uh, global health of gay and bi men. So, communauté, qu'est-ce que c'est? Communauté, c'est un programme qui a été mis sur pied, comme je viens de vous le dire, pour, la, pour promouvoir 
la santé et le bien-être des hommes gays. Comment, en mettant sur pied euh, des groupes de soutien, de la consultation individuelle et des ateliers, j'appuie sur le fait que nos ateliers ont été primordiaux, primordiaux, oui, euh, dans le travail qu'on a fait. Des hommes, une douzaine d'hommes provenant de l'immigration, seulement une personne née au Canada, à Montréal, au Québec, des gens de différents pays d'Afrique, des Caraïbes, de l'Amérique latine ont participé au programme. Des ateliers sur la santé sexuelle, les relations interpersonnelles, la famille, le travail, l'intégration à la vie québécoise. Et ce qui est ressorti, c'est que most of these men told us that it was the first time ever. Oops, microphone. Oh, avec plaisir. Sexy French. Alors, ce que les gens nous ont dit, c'est que c'était la première fois qu'ils se retrouvaient en groupe d'hommes noirs uniquement. Plusieurs ont été émus, touchés de se retrouver, de pouvoir parler de nos réalités. C'est un groupe par et pour les hommes noirs. Et on a parlé de nos expériences de l'enfance, de l'adolescence à l'âge adulte, du coming out, des relations difficiles avec la famille, de l'intégration au milieu de travail, du fait que nous vivions des réalités différentes de la majorité. Le plus gros défi est d'être complètement soi-même dans une communauté « at large » et dans la communauté « gay » et « bi ». Pourquoi un défi? Parce que la sexualité est omniprésente et nous sommes souvent le fruit de fétichisation, d'objectivation et d'hypersexualité. On voit encore aujourd'hui l'homme noir ou les hommes noirs comme des objets de fantasmes, de féti fétichisation, comme je l'ai dit, dans la sexualité. On enlève l'humanité, l'humanisme des gens pour ne voir qu'un fantasme à réaliser. So, en raison de ça, on a décidé à Réseau, un réseau dur à cuire depuis 30 ans. Réseau a 30 ans et on est très, très fiers d'exister depuis 30 ans. Come on, 30 years. Et, euh, merci. Donc, on a décidé de faire une campagne de sensibilisation pour euh, sensibiliser les hommes sur les applications, mais aussi un peu partout sur nos réseaux sociaux, à la réalité du racisme sexuel. Pourquoi? Parce que le racisme sexuel est encore inconnu. On n'en parle pas. On sait qu'il existe, non seulement auprès des personnes noires et afrodescendantes, mais aussi des personnes asiatiques, des personnes arabes, des personnes latino-américaines. Et comme le programme Communauté, en passant, Communauté, ça veut dire communauté en créole, en créole haïtien. Pourquoi on a choisi le créole haïtien? Parce que la majorité des personnes noires francophones au Québec depuis plus de 60 ans sont originaires d'Haïti. Alors, ce qu'on a fait, on a fait un focus group. Un focus group, encore une fois, emprunt d'émotions. Les gens qui étaient présents, une douzaine d'hommes, sont venus parler d'eux, sont venus parler des défis, de la difficulté d'avoir des relations amoureuses, saines, équilibrées et dans la longévité. Des hommes qui disent que dans les bars, dans les lieux de socialisation gay, on nous voit, encore une fois, comme un un objet de fantasme ou de fétichisation. L'ensemble de la personne que nous sommes, nous sommes, <rire> n'est pas considéré. Alors les hommes, euh, tout ça a un impact sur l'estime de soi, la confiance en soi, la santé mentale, beaucoup d'anxiété, beaucoup de dépression, la consommation de substances psychoactives, d'alcool, de drogue et, malheureusement, des comportements sexuels plus à risque. Ce qu'on veut dire par ça, euh, c'est que 
quand tu trouves difficilement des hommes intéressés à l'intégrité, à l'ensemble de la personne que tu es, ben, tu vas là où la sexualité t'est offerte. Dans des saunas, dans des autos, dans des parcs. Et tu acceptes plus facilement de ne pas te protéger. Tu acceptes la sexualité qui t'est offerte tout de suite, sans prendre part, sans tenir compte de tes limites, de tes choix, de prendre la PrEP, d'utiliser le condom, de... On se dit, mais j'ai de la sexualité, let's go. Et ce qui est prouvé en Amérique du Nord, Canada inclus, le taux de prévalence du VIH sida est plus élevé chez les hommes noirs et afro-descendants. L'homophobie intériorisée, le racisme dans la société et l'absence de relations amoureuses ou de partenaires sexuels choisis fait en sorte que le taux d'incidence du sida est encore malheureusement plus élevé. Et ce que ça fait, c'est que on a l'impression, beaucoup d'hommes nous ont dit pendant le groupe de discussion, qu'ils ne font pas partie d'une communauté à laquelle nous avons besoin de participer. Être noir et gay au Canada, c'est encore un défi, une bataille de tous les jours. On vit de la discrimination et du de la discrimination au sein de nos propres communautés parce qu'on ne peut pas être noir et gay dans plusieurs communautés, ça ne se fait pas. Alors, la campagne de sensibilisation. On a choisi quatre images, majoritairement des hommes ou des personnes noires et aussi une personne asiatique. Je vous traduis un peu les concepts. Le concept était de partir d'un préjugé lié à la sexualité et de le comparer à un préjugé qu'on retrouve dans la société en général. Alors, tu es noir, tu dois avoir une grosse graine. Est-ce que les traducteurs vont traduire ça? J'imagine que oui. C'est comme dire, euh, tu n'agis pas comme une personne noire. On entend souvent cette phrase-là, tu n'agis pas comme une personne noire. Comment agit une personne noire? Est-ce qu'il y a une façon propre à l'agir aux actions d'une personne noire? Être réduit à un sexe c'est enlever, encore une fois, notre humanité, c'est enlever l'ensemble des émotions, des sentiments, de la personnalité, de ce que nous avons comme à apporter dans, dans des relations sociales. Personne asiatique, c'est la même chose. Quand on pense que les hommes asiatiques ne sont que des « bottom », on enlève l'ensemble des comportements sexuels, des relations amoureuses, des sentiments, la tendresse, l'érotisme des gens. Quand, encore une fois, on croit à la puissance, très souvent, on associe l'homme noir à la puissance sexuelle, comme si on ne pouvait pas, nous aussi, être des gens qui avons besoin de tendresse, qui avons besoin de câlins, qui avons besoin de vivre une panoplie de comportements sexuels, il fallait, comme s'il fallait absolument être la personne qui domine, qui est forte, qui n'a pas besoin de l'ensemble des comportements sexuels qu'on peut avoir dans une société. Encore une fois, l'estime de soi, la confiance en soi, le bien-être, la santé mentale et sexuelle sont affectés. Ces affiches ont été dans les médias sociaux, bien sûr, mais aussi sur Grindr, Scruff, pour que les gens voient ce qui se passe, entendent ce qui se passe. Et le but, c'est de susciter une conversation qu'on commence à en parler. Arrêtons de faire semblant que le racisme sexuel n'existe pas dans notre communauté. Pas dans un but de culpabiliser les gens, dans un but de, trouver en sorte, de faire en sorte qu'il y ait une communication, des conversations et qu'on trouve des solutions. Quelles sont-elles les solutions? C'est d'être des alliés. On est des « queer ». On est nous-mêmes sujets à l'homophobie. On est nous-mêmes à la transphobie, au rejet, parce que l'isolement est un des impacts du racisme sexuel. Faire partie d'une communauté minoritaire, c'est bon pour la santé, c'est bon pour notre bien-être. Donc, ensemble, comme des gens qui sommes souvent rejetés, 
essayons de se soutenir. Quand on, vous entendez des commentaires racistes, des commentaires, euh, des préjugés sur les personnes noires, arabes, arabes asiatiques, latino-américaines, il faut réagir. Il faut dire qu'on ne qu'on n'accepte pas ça aujourd'hui en 2022 au Canada, parce qu'ensemble, on peut faire partie de la solution. Ça a l'air d'un message politique, mais ce n'est pas un, un message politique, c'est un message social. C'est ensemble qu'on peut faire partie du changement ou des changements. Il me reste une minute. Alors, ce que je vais conclure en disant simplement que faire semblant que le racisme n'existe pas, ça fait partie de la, de la problématique. Et dire qu'il y a du racisme, c'est commencer un travail. Il y en a dans la société en général, il y en a dans différents groupes et il y en a dans notre communauté. Donc, il faut pouvoir en parler au quotidien et faire en sorte que la santé mentale et le bien-être des hommes afro-descendants et des autres communautés culturelles soient au cœur de nos pré préoccupations communautaire, psychosocial, gouvernemental, politique, et je souhaite que chacune et chacun de nous, nous tous, nous mettions la main à la pâte, et c'est ce que Réseau fait. Réseau innove en mettant un programme comme ça de l'avant, et on souhaite qu'il y ait des bébés, que d'autres organismes à travers le Canada, de Saskatoon à Halifax, en passant par Kamloops, en passant par d'autres provinces, que partout on on travaille ensemble pour les BIPOC et que partout, ensemble, on fasse partie de la solution. C'est ce que Réseau fait et c'est beau de voir à quel point les gens se lèvent et sont contents d'être complètement eux-mêmes. Les hommes que nous avons rejoints sont partis des groupes de discussion en marchant la tête haute et en se disant qu'ils avaient leur place, qu'ils ont leur place dans la société. C'était très, très, très émouvant. Alors, je vous remercie de votre écoute et puis je vous souhaite de faire partie de la solution dès aujourd'hui et d'avoir du plaisir à le faire parce que ça goûte bon la différence. Hashtag diversité. Merci. Merci, Steve. Merci. Um, The next presentation by Martin Moorberg, who's the Two-Spirit Program Coordinator at CBRC, and Lane Bonnertz from CBRC as well, who's the Two-Spirit Program Lead, um, is the Medicine Bundle, honoring community and indigenous self-determination in sexual health research. Hello. Um, Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Martin Morberg. Um, I identify as Northern Toshone and Clinket. And the land that I belong to uh, is located in the central um, of Yukon Territory. So, uh, would you like to introduce yourself? Introduce yourself. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, okay, Itamix Kanatuni. Hi, good morning, everyone. My name is Lane Boners, and I am Blackfoot, uh, British, and German. Um, I'm a Pikani Nation member, which is where my mom was born and raised, and I grew up in that region as well, in the next town over. I currently reside in Montreal, or Jacques Chagé, which is unceded Ganyangahaga territory. And I was getting ready this morning, and I was thinking about that idea of honoring community and what that means. And then I realized that this is the first time I've been in a space talking about the medicine bundle where I wasn't in a room that was mostly indigenous. So in honoring community, I really want to recognize all of the two spirit voices that helped us realize this project and supported this project and that are also in this room with us today. Masi Cho Lane. Um, so what you could see on the screen here is an indigenous and two-spirit approach to the HIV self-test kit. So the HIV self-test kit 
became available in Canada in 2020. And um, all sorts of promotions started to happen and you know, organizations started to partner and access was being created to these uh, HIV self-test kits. And so um, I was a part of some of that and I started to go look for um, where Indigenous people were being reflected in some of that promotion that was happening. So uh, sad to say, we weren't there. Uh, there was, I think, about 50 peer navigators hired uh, clear across Turtle Island, what we call Canada. And uh, out of those 50, there was two Two-Spirit people, three? Yeah, and Not one, enough. And, and one Indigenous woman uh, that was going to help promote these uh, into our communities. So I went on one of the main websites that was promoting the HIV self-test kit, and I went looking for our representation. And what I found in the corner of one of the web pages was a little image of a dream catcher, uh, something very similar that you would find in a dollar store. And, and that was our, our representation of Indigenous people uh, being promoted the HIV self-test kit. So the Two-Spirit program uh, was given 500 HIV self-test kits to disseminate throughout the province of BC. And when we received them, I said, I'm not going to promote this to our communities um, without their involvement without being in conversation with them and hearing what it is that they need. And so uh, with that being said, um, we started a consultation process where we uh, began conversation with our Two-Spirit relatives throughout the province. And when I say relatives, I mean that we are in relation and as Indigenous people, we understand our interconnectedness that we're in relation to the land, to the water, to our medicines, and to each other, even though we are distinct groups of Indigenous people. So when we started conversation and doing these consultations with uh, Two-Spirit folks from around um, BC, uh, they started to identify some of the barriers that they were experiencing uh, in regards to accessing uh, adequate testing in rural and remote communities. And uh, some of the needs that were identified as well. And so one of the biggest barriers that they were experiencing was uh, cultural safety and uh, the lack of cultural safety in uh, the medical services system. Um, that being systemic racism, uh, transphobia, uh, homophobia, and also the intersections of some of the social determinants of health being experienced by these Two-Spirit people. Another thing that they were experiencing was the lack of confidentiality. So some of these people uh, are living in communities of three to 400 people. And you know when you're going to a nurse and maybe a relative or somebody is working in that clinic, um, it's going to be known and there has been disclosure that has happened like this in our communities where people uh, didn't have the safety of confidentiality. There was other barriers regarding uh, financial barriers um, and distance. Uh, people had to travel um, into more established towns with uh, better services or that was more accessible for them um, than their own community. So these financial barriers and travel barriers um, were some of the needs that were identified. And so it was my job uh, to go through those consultations and pull out um, you know, what they were experiencing. And it's, it's pretty heart-wrenching to see that you know, they're living in the province of BC and they don't have access to an HIV uh, test. So, after the consultations were done, uh, so we heard our community. We were in conversation with them and we heard what they said. And so it was our job uh, to respond to them. And so in order to respond to them, you know, in, in Western kind of structures uh, is the hierarchy. 
of you know executive director and then you have your directors of programs and managers and then you have your coordinators and you know at the bottom of that hierarchy is the community how am i supposed to know what a community needs if i'm not inviting them to the decision making table if i'm not in conversation with them asking them what they need and engaging with them from inception all the way to evaluation on how you know, we can best support them. So we established a Two-Spirit Guidance Committee that gave us direction and guidance um, on how to develop an Indigenous approach to the HIV self-test kit. And so they were engaged throughout the process. And what you see here on the screen um, is a medicine bundle. And so Indigenous people understand uh, the holistic approach to our health, that we are much more than just our bodies. We have a need for sexual health, for mental health, for emotional health, and most importantly, um, in our ceremonies and in our medicines, a deep need for spiritual health. And so that's what you see here today. And so uh, it was conceptualized so the medicine bundle is something that you carry with you and you hold your spiritual objects in it. And these are tools that uh, we take into ceremony with us. And these are tools that help nurture, um, you know, our, our spiritual aspect of our being. And so when we burn these medicines and we use them, it opens the doors for our ancestors to join us in accessing spiritual health. And so we understand and we acknowledge that these Western sexual health resources, um, such as the HIV self-test kit that you can see, there's a dry blood, um, blood spot test, uh, you see condoms, some lube, some access to uh, online resources. We acknowledge um, that these are effective, but it's in the approach of using them and how they're enforced on communities that can create harm. And so understanding that we have a deep spiritual need regarding our sexual health as well, we wanted to collaborate it with our own indigenous medicines. And so you can see sage, sweet grass, cedar, tobacco, bear grease, devil's club. Um, yeah, just, just to name a few uh, that are available. And so uh, this was our indigenous approach to responding uh, to the needs of uh, cultural safety and confidentiality. Um, so that was the development of the medicine bundle. And the basis of it uh, was the community's voice and then engaging the community, reporting back to the community, and really having them drive uh, this indigenous approach to the HIV self-test kit. And just kind of speaking to what Martin was saying, we are not removed from the communities that we serve, and those experiences are part of our own experiences. At the same time, though, we are separate people with our own teachings and our own beliefs, and that was a really essential part of creating that bundle because the bundle is very personal and it's very intimate and it has items of deep significance in our own lives through our life journey. And with the medicine bundle, sexuality and sexual health is also one of those journeys. So it was really important for us to allow those accessing the bundle to have the choice to access the traditional medicines that speak to their own teachings, but also the sexual health resources that speak to their needs. So along with the INSTI-HIV self-test kit, there were DBS kits to test for syphilis, hepatitis C, and HIV, as well as internal and external condoms and silicone-based lube. And a really fundamental part of that, honoring community, recognizing where we're connected, but also really acknowledging the differences was an essential part of the community support component. We had the trusted messengers. The medicine bundle pilot was in the province of British Columbia across all of the health regions. And we had eight indigenous and two spirit trusted messengers working in their own communities to have those conversations. 
use those existing connections and understanding the land that they live on and the land that they know to reach people in the most appropriate way with this message and this resource. And I really do have to give credit to those eight messengers because they were essential in this work and this message. So I think a lot of it had to do with just giving you an example. If we're hiring um, these ambassadors or peer navigators or messengers in urban city centers, um, and then we're supporting someone from a very rural and remote community, we're gonna have two very different experiences or perspectives in what it means to access adequate healthcare. And so it was really important that we uh, engage with these uh, indigenous people that were already living and existing and had strong relationships and networks in their own communities to be able to bring them to our uh, planning tables, to be able to offer knowledge in a very reciprocal way and really build that relationship with them. And through that relationality, uh, start exploring ways of how do we support our communities how do we make this accessible? How can we best support you in your community with your experience, with your relationships, with your networks um, to make this resource uh, available to the um, indigenous and two-spirit people within your community? So it was really important that they came to our planning tables, that they came to our decision-making tables. I'm an urban city dweller. I mean, I'm originally from the mountains in the Yukon, but I, I live in downtown Vancouver. So how do I know what's best for somebody, you know, living along Highway 16, living in Haida Gwaii, living out by Tofino? Uh, I don't. So it's so important. The way we work as Indigenous people is through relationships, that relationality and who you know. And I think one of the biggest um, things as well is it's a very colonial approach to come into our communities uh, in a very deficit-based um, perspective of identifying what you think our problems are and then bringing your colonial frameworks, you know, giving us an idea of what you think the solution is. And historically, if we look at that assimilation, we can see, and colonization, we could see how much harm that has created for us. So working with these trusted messengers and elders and the Two-Spirit Guidance Committee and the consultations, this was a collective effort. And through that collective effort, we were able to identify not resilience, we were able to identify the strength, the power, the wisdom, and you know, our indigenous resources, our ceremonies, our medicines, our elders, our knowledge keepers, to really be able to build off of that. This was a strengths-based approach. There was no deficit-based model here. And so we really wanted to build off that. And so um, there's a lot more initiatives coming up in the Two-Spirit program. And our pilot was very successful in the province of BC. It was a research project. We have gathered some really valuable information and have a better idea of where we need to focus a lot of our attention. Um, sorry, intention. And so we've partnered with a national organization. There was a partnership ceremony that took place just a couple of nights ago. Uh, and we're going to look at expanding the bundle nationally. We're gonna start in the prairies and we're gonna try and get some, uh, a national guidance committee and do consultations and be in conversation with Two-Spirit and Indigenous people throughout Turtle Island to have them really drive and steer this initiative of Indigenous approaches uh, to health, to health care. And as Martin was saying too, there was a research component to the medicine bundle. It was a short survey, and part of that was because we were tired of seeing two-spirit and indigenous LGBTQ data being diluted into LGBTQ data without accounting for how those experiences are different, how those understandings of who we are are different. Um, 
research does provide its limitations. And when we were going out into community and hearing feedback from the trusted messengers and the people that we were meeting along the way, there was a tremendous desire for youth-centered two-spirit resources that we weren't able to provide with the pilot because of those limitations of research. So back in August 2022, the Public Health Agency of Canada announced that they'd be giving out hundreds of thousands of NC HIV self-tests to different organizations across the country in providing those resources in unique ways. And we'll be able to continue the medicine bundle without that research component in the province of British Columbia in the coming months to account and recognize that need for a resource that can be accessed by youth who need it. The other thing that we heard was that the organizations, the health centers that are working in their communities, also wanted to have a role and be the ones actually providing these kits and having them on hand, these bundles to give directly to the people that they already know. The research limitations of the pilot did not allow us to do that. But with this extension happening in the province of British Columbia, we're able to provide these bundles directly to those providers and those familiar faces and those trusted caretakers in their own community. Yeah, just some self-determination. I just want to end with an acknowledgement. So there was many elders, many, many Indigenous elders, knowledge keepers, some of our aunties and cookums, um, our relatives, other Two-Spirit people, community members that we were in conversation with, uh, that we gathered with, that we've shared with, that a very reciprocal relationship of knowledge exchange, Indigenous women, Indigenous trans and queer folks uh, that really helped in the development of this initiative. I also uh, want to recognize um, the CBRC research team they were instrumental in some of the work that needed to be done, uh, and they showed allyship. They supported us uh, as we took the lead um, in doing this work in our own communities. So I just wanted to raise my hands in a good way to everyone that has contributed to this initiative, very much a collective, would have never been able to do it without our community. And so it's the opposite of hierarchy we flipped it right upside down and realized that the hierarchies don't work for us. Uh, we need to listen. We need to really listen and observe when our communities speak and when they gather and identify what it is they need and how we can best support them as they lead projects like the Medicine Bundle. Masi Cho, thank you. I want to thank um, everyone uh, who presented more than for your presentations, for all of the love and care that you put in the work that you do. So thank you very much. Um, we have time for maybe two questions. So there's a mic over here if you want to uh, come up and ask your questions. Vous pouvez poser vos questions soit en anglais ou en français ou en espagnol. Um, Donc, euh, j'invite euh, les gens ici. In the meantime, I want to echo um, what I think every person that presented, I think, uh, highlighted in terms of the importance of um, the communities taking the lead and then the structures providing support instead of all the way around. So I think um, all of the people that presented showed different ways of doing that. So um, congratulations on, on that work. Um, and I'm sure there's a lot more work like that being done. So hopefully we can see more about um, indigenous, black, and people of color, and um, immigrant and refugee experiences next year at the summit. So if you're doing any of that work, please submit more papers, because uh, it would be great to hear a bit more. Um, 
So if there's, now there's only time for one question. If someone has one question, that this is your chance. Donc, le temps pour une petite question en plus, parce qu'on approche l'heure du dîner. If none, if someone here on the panel, if there's like one last minute thought that you missed, that you have one minute uh, to share. I'm thinking about Percy how uh, yesterday about the silence. Uh, yes. Is it okay if I jump to the microphone? Is this all right? Of course. parler en français, si, if that's better. Um, so in the work that you're doing, you are bridging a bunch of different cultures that are specific to people's places that they are from, to the roots that they have, and to the cultures that they bring in. As you are here presenting this work in a primarily white space, in a white conference, how are you building that intercultural communication amongst the communities that you're working inside of? So intercultural communication inside of indigenous community, Afro-indigenous community, mixed indigenous community, with our black relatives, with our refugee, with migrant relatives, how are you bringing together the fact that like, we have something to hold on to, you know? And we have a place to start from. How are you bringing together those pieces that we have to start from, like in the work that you're doing so that you're building that network together? Because um, I've seen all of you do it here. Like, I've seen all of you network here, so I'm not trying to put the pressure on. I just am like, you're all awesome. Can you tell us about how more awesome you are? <laughs> well, one thing that I want to say is just by ex existing and by being there, we're doing a difference. And by talking with you, by being there with you, because we live in a society that's pretty di diverse. We work with non-BIPOC uh, or indigenous people, so therefore, it's already happening, you know? Day to day, day by day, we are part of a society where we are minorities. So therefore, we are facing challenges, but we are also working with some people who are part of solutions and want change. I do not myself see non-black people, non-BIPOC uh, people as, um, how do you say, um, enemy, enemies. Mm -hmm. I see people like what you just said, what people I work with on a daily basis do. I think we are part of the solution together. And what I do, what I make sure in the program Communauté that we go towards non-black people because we work and live in a society that's not prominent, um, pre, no, come on, pre, predominantly. predominantly, thank you, uh, black. So I do, we go and see non-black friends, we go towards, because we have to be seen, heard, understood, listened to, so I believe that's one of the little things we do on a daily basis, I don't know. I think just riding your coattails, I think visibility and taking up space is so important, right, to what you're saying. Um, when you go into queer spaces and you see people who don't look like you and you can think, oh, queer people come in all shapes and sizes and colors and things, and I think because of what we're shown in the media, the sort of dominant queer narratives that we're, we're told, sometimes we forget that yeah. anyone can be queer in a sense, right? So it's good to take up space, uh, with yourself, with your community, and um, meet people who may not, you know, be exposed to that. So. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, everyone. And the conference keeps going. It's lunch table, so that's an opportunity to keep uh, exchanging and sharing and listening. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you.